microphones and so on. So my name is Jim Harper. I'm with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems. And you are here today on this July 2nd to join us for a webinar on Livestock Campylobacter and Child Nutrition, findings from the formative research of the CAGE study in rural Ethiopia. I mentioned that we have uh, three speakers. We have two researchers, Ari Havilar and Sarah McCune from the University of Florida, who will be joining us very shortly. And you can see them on the, your video screen, hopefully. Uh, but first, we're going to invite Krista McNaughton from the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to join us for some introductory remarks. Kristen? Yeah. Good morning, all, and hello from the other Washington. Uh, my name is Kristen McNaughton. I'm a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on the Nutritious Food Systems Portfolio. Um, we co-fund the USAID Feed the Future um, Livestock Systems Innovation Lab, um, and our particular focus is research on um, animal feed and to the research about to be presented, which is trying to unpack the relationship between the agri-food system and child health outcomes from a risk reduction perspective. Um, we've long recognized the potential of livestock to be transformative for the lives of smallholder farmers and its contribution to the household income, resilience, and livelihood diversification to women's empowerment and to a healthy diet. Um, livestock and animal source foods are potential sources of protective assets and income, as well as high quality protein and essential bioavailable micronutrients across seasons, uh, which are often missing from the diets of the poor. And as such, we're heavily invested in improving productivity, production, and animal health. Um, but we're also aware of the enteric pathogens associated with livestock, their zoonotic potential, and the contribution to the global burden of foodborne disease. And recent evidence in particular has raised questions about the role of particular pathogens impact on nutritional status as mediated by direct, um, disruptions to children's gut health. And in that research, Campylobacter in particular has been flagged as, important, as an important one to understand. So in 2018, we funded a handful of investments seeking to understand the connections better between biological pathogens and child growth as linked to livestock and smallholder production systems. In this caged work, the Campylobacter genetics and environmental enteric dysfunction work is one of them. Um, and I'll turn it over to the team to say more. Thank you, Chris. It's a great pleasure uh, to um, introduce uh, our work to, um, to uh, the audience. Uh, welcome everybody wherever uh, you are. Um, and to do that together with uh, my colleague Sarah McCune. Uh, before moving to the uh, content of the presentation, I would like to mention that this research is actually the work of many people. We have a great study team. Uh, led from the University of Florida by Sarah and myself. Um, our implementing partner in Ethiopia is the Haramaya University, uh, led by uh, Jamal Yusuf, uh, Abdulmoumen Mohammed, and Kadir uh, Tejiroba. And then uh, we collaborate with the Ohio State University, uh, Wasim Gebreus, uh, Giresia Radeshikara, who lead the microbiology work and get net email at the uh, One Health office in uh, Addis Ababa, who supports us uh, from an ethical uh, and medical point of view. Mark Maneri at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, a pediatrician who supports us in the child health uh, assessments. Nigel French and his team at Massey University who support us on the Campylobacter genomics. The formative research has also been supported by a technical advisory group uh, chaired by Vivek Kapoor. And we have uh, both financial and intellectual support from the Food and Drug Administration, the Genome Tracker Initiative uh, with Mark Abbott and Kelly Hyatt. So um, even though only two people will be presenting today, uh, we want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of the whole team uh, to, uh, to this uh, project. Our uh, the background for our work is the persistent problem of uh, child stunting that still affects about 25% of children under five years of age globally, 35% of children in Africa and 38% in Ethiopia uh, on average and even higher numbers uh, in rural areas uh, of, of Ethiopia. And we know that stunting is associated with increased mortality from diarrhea, pneumonia, other infectious diseases impaired cognitive development, reduced income by up to 22%, reduced life expectancy, increased risk of chronic diseases later uh, in life, uh, which we are now seeing happening, for example, in, in India. Um, so there still is, even though the prevalence of stunting is decreasing uh, globally, there still is a need for interventions uh, 
to reduce this important cause of childhood morbidity and mortality. The um, long-standing UNICEF framework has um, uh, defined uh, two major conditions underlying stunting, uh, inadequate uh, diets and common infections such as malaria, diarrhea and lower respiratory uh, tract infections. And this slide uh, that was originally developed by, uh, by Mark Maneri, there's a third leg to, uh, to this tool which is good gut health and a lot of the work that we're doing folk centers around the need to support uh, absence of major diseases, uh, uh, adequate diarrheas with good gut health and understanding how gut health is affected by the child um, environment. We'll come back to that uh, in more detail later. Um, first of all, looking at the current state of knowledge about interventions to reduce stunting, there have been many studies uh, providing micronutrients, plant-based foods uh, to children. They do have significant effects, but they are modest, about 0.2 to 0.3 length for HC score, whereas stunting is defined as Z and LAZ score of minus two. Um, there have been some studies suggesting that animal source foods, uh, which are the best available sources of high quality nutrients, that they also have an impact and some studies suggest uh, a greater impact than plant-based foods on the LAZ score of, of children. A uh, study in, uh, uh, with eggs has shown about a 0.6 uh, impact, uh, but no nutritional intervention alone has fully prevented uh, stunting. So yes, there is a need for additional control of infectious disease agents, uh, but even then, three recent randomized controlled trials, the Bosch Benefit trials and the SHINE trial, uh, which combined uh, nutrient-based and uh, Bosch interventions, did not show any additional impact of the Bosch inter interventions above the uh, nutritional effects. So central to uh, the way that we have developed the case project uh, are two questions. One is, can exposure to animal excreta explain the limited effects of WASH in those uh, studies? And the second is that uh, even though we are very aware and a lot of the work of the Livestock Lab is focused on increasing livestock production and uh, by increasing livestock production, uh, increasing uh, the uh, improving the diets of these young children, can the uh, increased density of livestock uh, in uh, low and middle income countries increase the exposure of young children to animal excreta, the pathogens in those excreta, and impacting or maybe even negating the positive effects of improved uh, diets? Two central questions in our research. Um, the mechanism that underlies uh, the potential impact uh, of pathogens uh, in, in livestock, but not only in livestock uh, excreta, is a condition uh, known as environmental enteric dysfunction. It's found frequently in children in low and middle income countries, um, developing in the first three years uh, of life. Uh, it's characterized by a chronic inflammation of the small intestine, abnormal abnormal villus architecture, uh, reducing intestinal mucosal surface, thereby reducing the ability of children to absorb uh, nutrients. The etiology of the disease is highly complex. Uh, it's associated with unsanitary living conditions, uh, with colonization by intestinal pathogens and, and malnutrition. Generally, as uh, the development status of a country increases, the prevalence of EED decreases, uh, but the exact mechanisms by which that happens are far from uh, understood. There is increasing evidence that uh, colonization by enteropathogenic bacteria and then specifically asymptomatic colonization not accompanied with diarrhea is involved in the causation of, uh, of EED. And we know uh, that colonization with Campylobacter species in particular is very common in children in low and middle income countries. Uh, studies like the MEL-ED study have recorded prevalence up to 75% in one-year-old uh, children in countries like uh, Bangladesh and Tanzania. Uh, this is a slide uh, from the MEL-ED uh, study. Uh, it's uh, rather complex. I just want to point out some of the main findings of this uh, study. Uh, complementary food in this study, MEL-ED was a birth cohort study following children from 24 months from birth. Complementary food was found to be positively associated with the LAZ uh, score, diarrheal disease negatively associated, but there were also very strong effects of asymptomatic colonization by specific enteropathogens. 
And in this figure, you can see that particularly Shigella, enteroaggregated E. coli, and Campylobacter were involved in lower LAZ scores uh, at the age of uh, two years. Uh, Shigella and enteroaggregated E. coli are less prevalent than Campylobacter in these children. So on a population basis, these data suggest that Campylobacter is one of the main pathogens underlying uh, the, uh, the mechanisms of uh, EED and, and ultimately uh, stunting. Mm -hmm. And the authors uh, of these studies, uh, James Bletz Mills and colleagues, uh, explicitly stated that uh, their work suggests modifying the long standing UNICEF framework of malnutrition by adding anthropathogen infection in the absence of diarrhea. So we're very interested in understanding the prevalence and the mechanisms of this in asymptomatic uh, infection. So what do we know about exposure to Campylobacter? We know from uh, high income countries mainly that chickens, livestock generally, are major reservoirs of Campylobacter and that there's a variety of transmission pathways, food, direct animal contact, environmental contamination. And the pathway, the importance of pathways varies by setting. Foodborne transmission is thought to be uh, important in industrialized countries, uh, but uh, environmental and direct animal contact transmission may be more important in low and middle income countries. And we actually have very few data for children and for adults in low and middle income countries uh, to quantify the importance of different transmission pathways. Um, one of our central uh, hypotheses also is that if we would be able to control the reservoirs, if we know the reservoirs, and control exposure to the reservoirs, for example, the animal excreta that should reduce colonization of children irrespective of the pathways. So the central hypothesis in our study is that Campylobacter species, which are the natural inhabitant uh, of the gastrointestinal tract of livestock and poultry, are among the main pathogenic bacteria involved in the causal chain of stunting due to the exposure of young children directly or indirectly to the feces of these animals. And I'll now turn over to Sarah to tell you a little bit more about the way we set up the formative research. Great, thanks Ari. So our formative research set out to address three main objectives. The first two listed here come from ethnographic research and the third from a cross-sectional study. So the first two really aimed to understand that local context. So to dig into the sociocultural beliefs and have a better idea of the social organization and how it related at the time of the onset of this study specifically to poultry production, but also in general about livestock to understand the relationship between those livestock production systems and dietary intake, particularly of ASF, but also of other, um, other foods across um, the, that may be prevalent in the diet, wash and child growth, but looking particularly with an eye on how they pertain to Campylobacter infection and the epidemiology of that disease. The second objective was to explore community level opportunities as we set out to design a study. So we wanted to understand how we might break, how we might make this livestock production more biosecure and to reduce zoonotic disease prevention. So at the time we were specifically looking at designing um, a project, an intervention that would focus on caging poultry. That evolved as you'll see in these results. Um, this, the third objective, which comes from the cross-sectional study, was to measure the prevalence of Campylobacter species, colonization, EED, and stunting in children, as well as the risk factors associated with those three outcomes in young children in rural Ethiopia. Next slide. So as indicated, we employed two, two major methodologies. The first was an ethnographic research um, piece, if you will, um, that happened between March and May of 2018. Important, all of these things are progressive, and so the ethnographic research, while part of the formative research, also informed how we did the cross-sectional study. Um, that three-month endeavor was, eth was what we call rapid ethnographic, um, a rapid ethnographic approach, where we were in a cabele for about a week answering questions about themes that I'll outline in a moment. The second, the cross-sectional study, um, happened that fall between October and December of 2018 and was made up of a household survey as well as child and environmental samples and, and anthropometric measurements of children. Here you have a map of Ethiopia and you can see in eastern Ethiopia our target area of Haramaya Wareda, the green. 
um, on the on the map. Um, within Jaramillo Wereda, we targeted five Cabeles for the formative research and villages within those, which I'll talk more about within each study design. So the, the ethnographic research really aimed to address 10 themes that we identified with our colleagues and partners in Ethiopia going in. Um, we again focused at the time really on, on poultry production within the realm of livestock, but also more general connections between livestock production, management, food safety, on into child health and growth. Um, you can see that other, other more general development indicators that intersect and form the underlying drivers of malnutrition and child growth, such as WASH, gender roles, which are really important, as well as livelihoods and environmental change. Um, climate change in particular is something that we went in, uh, we went going in to look at the effects because from a common narrative um, standpoint, uh, people will tell you that climate change is really changing the landscape in this area. Next slide. The findings from the ethnographic research are presented in the next two slides. Um, importantly, for those of you who may not be aware of the region, this is an Islamic uh, part of Ethiopia, which is distinguishing from other areas of Ethiopia. Um, so the high majority of participants in the study practice Islam. Um, the agricultural landscape is evolving rapidly to be dominated by chat production. Chat is a mild stimulant that's grown and produced as a cash crop in the region. And the heart of chat production for the world is Ethiopia, but for Ethiopia is right at the heart of where we're working. So Awida is a small town just down the road from Haramaya University that really represents the economic hub of chat production for export. Um, so that, that certainly influences uh, the landscape and a lot of things that we'll talk about in this study. One of the major findings was that eggs were not consumed. And again, we're looking at um, children, but also just normative dietary practice. Um, so while eggs may be part of Ethiopian diet, in some places, kids are not consuming eggs in this area because they were considered, an, quote, too luxurious. So this was something that was explained by extreme poverty dietary norms, so what people considered norm, normal to eat, but also by parental fatalism um, and a general lack of awareness of the benefits of putting eggs into the diets of young children. In terms of the landscapes, landscape, uh, livestock were dominant on, in most homestead, homesteads, and that composition of livestock was typically uh, one cow, a few small ruminants, and a few chickens. So not large livestock herds, but most households had um, some livestock. Homesteads are comprised of multiple households. I'll show you an image in the next slide. Um, but across the homesteads, particularly in the, in the outdoor space, so you're outside of a home but within a homestead, um, there was high levels of contamination with human as well as animal feces. This was an important finding because we went into the study uh, with a general understanding from partners and literature that um, open defecation would be lower than it, than it ended up being. Um, so this was an important part that we found in the ethnographic research. Um, and then the other piece is simply that humans and animals co-house. So I'll, again, there are images coming up, but um, in this context, animals and humans share um, a, a living space often, and particularly at night. Um, houses are one room and may have a, a dividing wall, may not, may, ju may just have a place to tie up animals. But typically the animals are brought inside the home at night. And so you have this cohabitation of animals and humans in a, in a very small space. Um, and particularly children who might be crawling around on their hands and knees. You can, again, the findings on chicken production really focused on the indigenous breeds of chickens. That was what people were keeping. There are exotic and improved breeds in the region, but the indigenous breed is pre pre uh, preferred. And people tend to have on average about six chickens per household. Um, chickens are women's domain, though there's increasing interest among men, particularly young men, as per chicken production is more systematic and organized, it, it begins to move from a woman's domain into a man's domain. The benefits and motivations for people to have chickens and keep them are the eggs, which they largely sell, meat, which is sometimes consumed, and the sale of roosters and, for, and the use of fertilizer. There is significant land pressure because of population growth in the area and the use of land for chop production, which make chicken more, more attractive than larger, um, well, small or large ruminants, but lar larger livestock. 
and lack of feed is by and large a major constraint. So chickens tend to be uh, free ranging and scavenging chickens. Next slide. Can you advance, Ari? I did. Thank you. Oh, just taking a minute to catch up. Thank you. Um, these pictures are probably loading. So what you'll see in the image is some shots. The bottom left shows you a homestead where there are multiple homes opening up into a common courtyard area with chickens and kids running around. Upper left is a picture of the inside of a home, very typical with woven mats on the floor, mattresses pulled aside during the day, but that's where people sleep. And if you just turn over your right hand shoulder, then you'll see the image to the right where um, an area of that room is cordoned off for poultry to be brought in and tied up at night. Next slide. Coming. And yeah, my image isn't loaded yet, but I know what it looks like. So I'll go ahead and tell you what you're going to be looking at is an outdoor kitchen area where you'll see chickens moving in and out of the area where women are cooking. In the bottom right, you'll see again that interaction between children and livestock is quite common. And in the upper right hand corner, demonstrating the, the high, highly prevalent um, occurrence of um, feces, animal feces on the landscape. So the second piece of our formative research comes from the cross-sectional study. Um, our study design was in those five, five randomly chosen cabelis, which were selected based on maximized distance from each other. We did not select cabelis that were adjacent to Haramaya University where there had been significant research prevalence, pre, prevalent presence previously. Um, parent reported birth dates were largely inaccurate. This is documented in some of the publications that are coming out in more detail, but we ended up using a local calendar and um, engaging in lengthy discussions to appropriately estimate actual birth dates. Um, we had high participation despite social unrest at the time. We did have one child decline consent at the time of um, requesting consent. However, when we went to collect data, five declined at that point and two were reintroduced. So again, this is all documented in the publications, but just to give you an idea of how we landed at our final sample of 102 children, um, with a median age of 12, ranging from 11 to 15 months. Um, that distribution is in the bottom right-hand corner. General findings, I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly. Um, about 50-50 male-female, this is the child population. Um, almost all were breastfed at birth and most were still breastfed. Um, about only half were only fed breast milk in the first three days. So breaking the, the definition of exclusive breastfeeding by feeding something other in those first three days was quite common. Um, minimum dietary diversity score for infants this age, inclusive of breastfeeding, only 9%. So 9.4% met that threshold. Animal source food consumption is quite low. Most of the animal source food consumption that did occur was milk. Um, diarrhea and fever, very common in this population, about almost half of the population reporting both either diarrhea or fever in the past um, 15 days. And at the time of data collection, self-reported uh, di current diarrhea was 12% and fever at 5%. That, that average, I'm sorry, the mean dietary um, diversity score that I referenced earlier was 3.5. In terms of animal ownership and hygiene, um, takeaway message here is most households had livestock, 94%, with 1.6 uh, tropical livestock units, so relatively small holdings. Mo about half produced chicken, um, most produced um, had some uh, small stock, so sheep or goat, 80%, and about 60% uh, of people had at least one cow. We, because of our interest at the time, developed a chicken nighttime location score, sort of indicating the proximity of chickens to children in the household by where they were kept overnight and whether they were contained. This is based on literature that shows that chicken being in the household is a risk factor associated with stunting. So 50% of kids were not exposed to chickens at night. About a quarter of families had chickens inside the house at night, but they were confined. The other quarter had them in the house unconfined. And as indicated by the ethnographic research, open defecation was normative for 77% of households, while the remaining 23% had limited sanitation facilities. Those are based on JMP ladder guidelines. And finally, looking at the outcomes that we were really focused on, uh, that these were leading up to, stunting and um, EED were both quite high in the population. So 41% of children had an LAZ score of less than negative two. Uh, ranging from 33, sorry, 32 to 51%. That's on the first line. 
And if you jump down to EED, you can see 50% of children had EED. We've broken out and presented here for you also the rates of wasting and severe wasting and stunting. Um, MWAC, the, the acute malnutrition as indicated by a middle upper arm circumference score of less than 125 millimeters was 30%. Um, of note, the EED score, there's no gold standard for EED. And so what we used here are standards and thresholds defined by our colleague, Mark Maneri. I'm not sure if Mark's with us or not, um, but those are listed on this slide for your reference. Ari, back to you. Thank you, Sarah. So zoom in now on the findings of the microbiology. We use different methods uh, to detect and identify Campylobacter uh, bacteria. Uh, culture methods uh, were not successful due to technical problems. Uh, we'll be focusing here on molecular methods uh, for detecting Campylobacter. And one of the methods we used was uh, PCR. Um, you can see in this uh, slide that uh, in 50% uh, of uh, the children we did detect Campylobacter uh, genus uh, by PCR. Uh, we applied two uh, species-specific PCR tests uh, and identified uh, C. jejuni in 13% of the children, C. coli in 2% of the children. So at least in 36% uh, of the children, uh, other Campylobacter species than the well-known jejuni coli uh, would have been uh, present. And this was the first signal for us that the Campylobacter uh, composition in these children might be very different from what we knew from children in, in high income uh, countries. We were lucky that uh, we could set up a collaboration with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, who applied their metagenomic total RNA sequencing methodologies using their IBC pipeline uh, for us. Uh, using this method, uh, we even found uh, signals, uh, genetic signals of prevalence of Campylobacter species in 88% of all children. Compared with uh, Campylobacter jejuni and coli were also highly prevalent uh, according to, to this method. But notably, we also found very high prevalence of Campylobacter hyointestinalis, one of the main species in what is commonly known as non thermal tolerant or emerging uh, Campylobacter uh, species. We also found some unnamed species related to Campylobacter hyointestinalis, so Campylobacter obsaliensis uh, and uh, a, a Campylobacter species that has not yet been cultured and only been identified by molecular methods. So take home message from this uh, slide, uh, I think, is that uh, there is a high prevalence of Campylobacter. When you look at the uh, reads per million, you see that the average is about, uh, it's over a thousand, uh, more than 2000 reads per million. So uh, quite a high proportion of all the bacteria in, in the fecal samples of these children actually were Campylobacter. Um, and that there is a large variety, but only listing uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, species here overall. I think we found 29 different uh, Campylobacter species, although obviously, we have to be aware that uh, the reference databases for these species are relatively sparse, so species identification may be unreliable. But the, the overarching uh, message is that there are a lot of other Campylobacter species in addition to the well-known Jejuni and coli in the fecal samples of these children. Um, we did uh, uh, risk factor analysis, and, and these are the key results from the multivariate analysis uh, that, that we uh, ultimately uh, developed. Uh, two uh, positive, uh, two, two significant risk factors for Campylobacter, uh, two uh, for uh, EED. We um, corrected for age, sex, and Cabelli group as uh, confounders. One of the remarkable findings is that uh, in one of the five Cabellis, there was a much higher prevalence of Campylobacter than, than in other uh, Cabellis. Uh, we still need to, uh, to find uh, ways to explain that, and that will be one of the questions we'll be asking in, in the next uh, study to, to zoom more in on geospatial distribution of Campylobacter colonization. You see in the, in the slide here that current breastfeeding was a highly significant risk factor for Campylobacter colonization, as was animal source food consumption. And Sarah just mentioned that uh, this was mainly milk. Uh, in discussions uh, with our local collaborators, uh, we have understood that most of this milk would be raw milk, uh, that uh, boiling or heating milk is very uncommon uh, in the area. 
Current diarrhea was uh, a risk factor for uh, elevated EED biomarkers, but because diarrhea in itself uh, increases inflammation and intestinal uh, permeability, uh, this is uh, an expected uh, finding. We also found that an improved source of drinking water was protective uh, against uh, EED. Um, coming back to the, to the breastfeeding, um, would like to quote uh, a recently published study from Christine Simanke's group uh, that they also found in the GEMS uh, study, samples from the GEMS study, that exclusively breastfed infants with diarrhea exhibited higher Campylobacter abundances. Um, C. jejuni, C. coli were prevalent, but they also identified Campylobacter, uh, other Campylobacter species, and a very abundant species, uh, they actually named it Candidatus Campylobacter infants. It has not been cultured yet. It's only been recognized by molecular signals. Um, looking at the uh, phylogeny, uh, this uh, is highly related to Campylobacter high intestinalis, Campylobacter fetus. So it may well be that some of the uh, samples, uh, some of the isolates that we found are this new species, although uh, Christine's group looked in, in our molecular signals, did not confirm the presence. Uh, but we're looking again at this group of high intestinalis fetus, uh, which is very prevalent uh, in, in the children and may be related to, to breastfeeding. So the conceptual model that uh, arises out of our work um, partly confirms our uh, major hypothesis. We still uh, think that uh, livestock ownership uh, is driving uh, the Campylobacter uh, epidemiology uh, in, in our study area. On the one hand, affecting uh, child diets, uh, uh, but also through animal management and wash conditions, uh, ultimately affecting the prevalence of Campylobacter, EED and, and stunting. You must know that our study was powered for prevalence estimation, not for risk factor estimation. So some of the uh, uh, risk factors may have been important, but were not significant in, in this limited uh, sample set. What we are now uh, working towards is a longitudinal study, a birth cohort study, where we will follow children from birth uh, up until uh, one, one and a half years, uh, depending on how quickly we can uh, get back to the field work, uh, obviously uh, currently uh, halted uh, because of the COVID-19 epidemic. And the main questions that we want to study there is to better understand the prevalence, the species composition and the genomic diversity of both the thermotolerant and the non-thermotolerant capitalized species in these children. Also adults, livestock, other reservoirs uh, and humans uh, in, uh, in, in the Haramaya Vereda. Uh, based on those data, uh, quantify the attribution of Campylobacter infections in the children to humans, uh, to livestock and other reservoirs, and also study the associations among the presence of Campylobacter species, the gut microbiota, and the health status of uh, the children. Although, again, uh, because of uh, resource limitations, our sample size is limited, so we will not be able to pick up more than very strong signals uh, for this, uh, this last uh, question. Um, embedded in uh, the uh, uh, case study is a separately funded study led by uh, our colleague Song Liang, uh, where we also collaborate with Emory University, the XCAM study. CAGE focuses on uh, the reservoirs uh, and XCAM focuses on the transmission pathway. So the approach of uh, XCAM based on the SENIPATH approach developed by, uh, by Christine Mouse group in, in Emory is to very uh, detailed uh, characterization of space-time patterns of children's behavior in their living environment. Where are the children? What are they exposed to in terms of uh, oral uh, ingestion? And then to detect, quantify and characterize Campylobacter at the key uh, contamination uh, interfaces and uh, entering all that information in mathematical models to assess uh, child exposure to Campylobacter and then from there build to uh, estimate infection risks and compare that to what we're finding in the case study in terms of observed uh, prevalence. So together, those two studies should give us a very detailed assessment of uh, reservoirs and transmission pathways and impact uh, on the health of uh, children uh, in, in the study area. So in conclusion, 
uh, we are working with a traditional society of smallholder farmers uh, where there is a recent evolution towards cash economy, chip production uh, particularly. Uh, there is a low level of sanitation and a high level of cohabitation with, with livestock uh, in the area. There's a high level of breastfeeding, but poor complementary uh, diets. We've observed uh, a high prevalence of, of stunting. I remember 41% stunting of children of just uh, under one and a half years of age compared to the average in rural Ethiopia of about 40%, so uh, even higher than in other areas in Ethiopia. A high prevalence of EED and asymptomatic Campylobacter infections. We didn't find any significant associations between those factors yet, but again, that may be due to the low, low power of our current uh, sample set. Apart from the well-known uh, Campylobacter jejuni and coli, we've seen a common occurrence of emerging Campylobacter species that are understudied. Um, and we know very little about the reservoirs, transmission pathways and health impacts of those studies, even in high income countries, but certainly in low and middle income countries. What we do know is that uh, they are potentially related to ruminants and to other livestock, but also that human to human transmission cannot be included. So our initial hypothesis that chickens uh, are the main source of Campylobacter exposure was not confirmed by the formative research, uh, chickens probably still are important, but we also have to uh, consider uh, ruminants particularly as an additional source of Campylobacter and broaden our study objectives. This is one of the most important findings, I think, of the formative uh, research. We found that Campylobacter colonization is positively associated with animal source food, raw milk uh, consumption, and current breastfeeding. To our opinion, this absolutely does not mean that we should discourage breastfeeding. The mechanisms uh, that underlie this positive association are poorly understood. They may have to do with uh, sugar uh, metabolism uh, of the bacteria in the child guts, but also with uh, impacts of breastfeeding on uh, microbial diversity uh, in the child guts. Um, we think this is another strong signal that exposure of these children to uh, Campylobacter should be controlled so that they can harvest the full benefits of breastfeeding and also, of course, of improved animal source foods in their uh, diets. We found improved drinking water supply is protective against uh, EED. It's still relatively rare in the area, uh, so a strong uh, 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 factor to study again. And we are planning to do further studies to better understand the Campylobacter reservoirs, the transmission pathways and the impacts ultimately to advise on and probably uh, possibly design uh, further intervention studies. So with that, I would just like to show you uh, our standard uh, disclaimer and open this presentation up for discussion. Thanks for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Ari. Um, Sarah, if you could uh, unmute yourself as well. Um, we're going to start taking a Q&A. We have about eight questions already, so that may fill up our time. We're do, doing really well, though. Um, the first one, I believe, is for Sarah because it's from Felicia Wu, and it's a two-part question. First, it starts with parental fatalism. Did you use cultural theory, theory in determining this? And the second question was, if there was low dietary diversity, what were the staple foods of these households? Yeah, I'll do my best to answer both those questions. So the first question around cultural theory, um, the ethnographic research was led by an anthropologist who would be better positioned to answer that question. I was part of that team, but I can tell you specifically that that was coming from narratives, um, and I'm happy to share in the chat box the, the publication on this, um, but about sort of really a fatalistic view about malnutrition and how much of it was within the power of control of parents. And so there are quite common um, axioms about poverty being the root cause of malnutrition in the area, not just as an observer reading those, but coming endogenously. And then the other piece that I think is important and from which this stems is um, a, a, a narrative around once children go up on two feet, so a cultural belief that a child, once a child goes upright on their two feet, that their growth from there forward is out of, out of parents' hands. So there is attention and investment in children sort of when they're um, immobile or on, on four legs, if you will, 
but that once they're on, once they're bipedal, that at that point it's, it's in God's, it's in God's hands and not for a parent to interfere with the trajectory of that child. So I think that's the origin of the, of the fatalism, um, the parental fatalism piece. Uh, the second question about uh, dietary diversity. So the, we are using the modified as of January 2020 um, minimum dietary diversity score for infants and young children, which is inclusive of breastfeeding. So a score of two to three is an old score of one to two, um, which basically means one to two food groups outside of breast milk were consumed given the high rates of breastfeeding in this population. And those were largely, it was grains and that, that collection in terms of dietary diversity and um, legumes. So lentils are common in the area and other ty types of legumes. So grains and, and basically not fruits and vegetables and not uh, animal source food. There was, as Ari said, some milk um, outside of that. I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. Um, we had uh, some other questions. We had one, which I think is more of a comment, but we may not be able to answer. Someone was asking about other studies uh, detecting pathogens that cause resistance to infectious diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa. If we're aware of those, this person wants to collaborate. So let me actually go on to the next question. Um, Let's see, were the stools run by the IDSEQ both diarrheal and asymptomatic? Yes, um, the, uh, as, as uh, you've seen, the, the prevalence of current diarrhea from the top of my head was about 15% uh, uh, in, in our sample set, uh, but we did all samples uh, that were available. Uh, one child with, with diarrhea uh, did not produce any feces, uh, even though we went back uh, several times. So one child with diarrhea was excluded from the sample set and we were able to analyze these tools from all children. We didn't find uh, a major difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic tools uh, in this uh, study in terms of Campylobacter diversity. All right, next question. Surprising finding was breastfeeding being a high risk factor for Campylobacter. Is it not transmissible via breast milk or is it? That's a very good question. One of the questions that we will study uh, in, in our follow-up uh, work. Uh, in the XCAM study, we are going to ask the mothers to provide us with a sample of breast milk and also an aureola swab um, to uh, see wh whether the bacteria do colonize the milk or maybe transmit it uh, through the, the act of, uh, of breast uh, feeding. Um, I mentioned uh, the study from uh, Christine Samansky's group based on uh, samples from uh, the GEMS uh, study uh, where this relationship uh, has been explored uh, in, in quite a bit of uh, detail. Uh, the, the reference uh, is, is in my slide and I would highly encourage you to also read that publication. Excellent. I just want to uh, make a quick note because there was a question in the chat about if they could get this presentation. Yes, it will. Uh, this recording and the presentation will be made available on our website. Um, also in the chat, I shared a, um, a four-page brief which kind of summarizes many of the, the things that were discussed today. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, and the next question is about the PCR. What was the detection limit on the Campylobacter PCR? Um, I would not be able to answer that question. I don't know if uh, Garish or Loik are Online? Both on the line. Yeah, see if one yeah. of them can field it. We had a, an answer from Jiresh that PCR used was a conventional PCR, not a quantitative PCR. Okay. Next question Was antibiotic use assessed? Um, I think we asked for that, Sarah. Yeah, we did ask it. It has not been analyzed in the context of these findings. We are looking at it. We have another paper coming out on maternal and child health focused on these data, and we'll, we'll be engaging it in that context. It's also something we asked a simple, straightforward question. Um, and given the important, given where our findings have gone, we're aware that we probably need to probe further because people don't necessarily understand or know what they're being treated for when they're given antibiotics. So there has to be a little bit more follow through, which is part of the reason we didn't use the data in this analysis. But we did ask an initial question, um, which we'll be publishing elsewhere and moving forward, we'll ask it in a more robust way so that hopefully we can better understand uh, when and which antibiotics people have been using. <laughs> 
Um, I also wanted to note we have very good participation today with 96 participants. And I'm one of them. I just learned something today, Ari. I wanted to ask you about the unnamed species of Campylobacter. Could you explain that? Does that mean you've discovered new species or we just don't know about them? Well, there is, there is a process uh, before uh, a bacterial species is, uh, is formally uh, named. Um, and um, for many of these emerging species, that process uh, has not been uh, completed. There are some tentative names uh, that have been suggested by uh, people who have uh, first discovered those uh, bacteria, but they have to be uh, confirmed by the International Committee on Bacterial uh, Taxonomy. Well, I hope they uh, also include your name on one of those. Um, <laughs> So the next question, um, the OR13 uh, for current breastfeeding seems too high. Uh, the person is asking, what is the 95% CI? Uh, what was your population distribution of current breastfeeding and no feeding? Uh, this seems especially problematic since breastfeeding is very common. Yes, that, that is true. Uh, I, uh, I don't have the, uh, the confidence interval uh, handy. Um, when I go back to the slide, the, the p-value was 0.006, so uh, it was quite significant. Um, but again, these were small samples uh, and uh, we, uh, we, would, um, we would have uh, to, to interpret all these, these findings with, with care, but uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to share more details uh, after this meeting. And a related question, uh, what is your hypothesis about why the breastfeeding is related to the Campylobacter colonization and will you be studying that? Um, we're not going into so much detail. Uh, Christine Szymanski's group uh, at the UGA is, is very interested in doing uh, much more mechanistic uh, work on this uh, study. Their publication has looked at uh, FUCOS, uh, which is an exclusive uh, nutrient uh, in breast milk, uh, but this could not explain uh, the findings uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that children are more colonized. Uh, there may be uh, an interaction uh, between FUCOS, uh, gut microflora, maybe other uh, metabolites in breast milk that affect the gut microflora and that in turn affects the Campylobacter uh, community. So that's one of the reasons why in our next study, we also want to characterize uh, the gut microflora more generally uh, using metagenomic sequencing methods. So we will study this uh, at the level of communities, but not uh, do very deep mechanistic studies. This question is also for Dr. Havilar. Uh, would you have expected to find EE when there uh, when the Campylobacter was associated with uh, animal source foods um, and BF, I'm not sure what that's referring to. Breastfeeding. Okay. Breastfeeding. Yeah. And the E yes. is uh, enteric. Is that written? I think e it's e e e is, uh, enteric environmental. It says EED. I assume it so. just says EE. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, we, we know that. Um, Campylobacter causes uh, inflammation in, in human guts. It's actually uh, the main reason why uh, humans develop diarrhea. It's, it's the, the inflammation, uh, the, uh, the immune response uh, to, uh, to, to the bacteria. So in that sense, it's not surprising uh, that uh, they can also cause uh, chronic uh, inflammation. Um, so this is something that, that we expected and, and is part of say, the underlying uh, evidence uh, base. Uh, there's been very uh, interesting uh, animal studies done at the University of Virginia with Dick Grant uh, and others uh, that also look at the mechanisms of uh, how Campylobacter causes uh, this inflammation uh, and uh, in relation also to, to nutrient deficits. Can I chime in just for just to go back as the non microbiologist on this team and say, you know, one of the things we're really trying to unpack is in the original study and in the ongoing work is to understand whether Campylobacter is driving EED and gut function and whether that is driving growth. And our hypothesis was always that animal source food and the livestock derived, let's be clear, we're talking about livestock derived animal source food in this context, whether that is a, source, a reservoir, a source for disease transmission through that pathway that we hypothesize. So you can go back and see that um, 
conceptual diagram that Ari presented at the end. I know it was a little bit hard to see because it's small, but that really maps out those hypothesized pathways. And I think this finding is not, um, does not, uh, does not complicate that. It simply gives, in some ways, as Ari said, a really important finding was that ASF consumption, which was milk, was associated um, with some of these risks and, and that we really need to unpack further um, what are the reservoirs and what are the modes of transmission. And as he said, while we're looking at reservoirs in the CAGE study moving forward, we do have this parallel work with XCAM where we're really focused on transmission pathways. And we'll be looking at infants from birth, which is, I think, really important in this conversation around breastfeeding. So at a very, very young age, trying to understand when and how colonization of Campylobacter in infants is occurring. So I think the, it's the collection of those two studies that will allow us to really better answer some of these questions, even though we're not doing the research on the gut mechanistic um, relationship between breastfeeding and um, Campylobacter colonization in kids. All right, great. It looks like we might actually get through all of these questions. I'm going to combine a few of them right now um, because we'll be ending in about five minutes. Um, this question is about uh, how the bacteria colonizes and uh, do you think it's through hands, through the chickens, the teat of the mother? And then there's the question about uh, pregnant women. Uh, are they one of the factors? Um, so, I think that question is one of the core questions we want to answer in, uh, in the follow-up studies, in the longitudinal study for case and the XCAM. Uh, we know that uh, Campylobacter can use a, a variety of pathways, there's a variety of reservoirs, um, and our goal in our next studies will be to uh, quantify those, uh, those pathways so that um, we either can uh, advise uh, people in the area, but maybe broader, if this is generalizable, uh, which practices uh, would lead to most reduction of exposure to Campylobacter? Uh, would that be raw milk? Uh, or uh, is it more um, hands that contaminate uh, the transmission from animal sources? Uh, is, is breastfeeding a direct source of exposure or not? So. Uh, these are the, the, the exact questions that, that we want to, to answer. So at the moment, I don't think we can give an answer, but these are central to our follow-up work. All right, Nikolai, thanks for your comments and congrats to all involved. Great work. We have a question from Emily Uma. Was the consumption of raw meat also considered in the risk factor assessments? Consumption of raw meat is common in some areas of Ethiopia. Yeah, I'll take this. Um, so we did not ask explicitly about raw meat consumption. Um, we did do dietary intake of the mother as well as the child. Um, and and as, I, as indicated, none of the children were eating any flesh. So the only ASF that were consumed by the kids in our study were milk and eggs. And those were why those two were presented. Um, we, did not we did not qualify when flesh was eaten, so when flesh and meat were eaten by the mother, whether it was raw or not, we did ask a series of questions around um, slaughtering animals in the home from a food safety standpoint. Um, so we might be able to get at some of that, but the answer is no, we didn't look at it directly, but I think it's safe for the animal, for the um, child consumption side because they did not eat any meat. Okay, I, I, get, I think we have one more question maybe that slipped in here. Uh, let's see, Campylobacter species and strains differ between hosts and sources. How will you use this to attribute source? Yes, so we, uh, in the follow-up study, uh, we plan to use uh, three methods. Uh, one is culture, both uh, thermotolerant and non-thermotolerant uh, Campylobacters and they will all be uh, sequenced uh, in the Genome Tracker Lab uh, at the Ohio State uh, University. And then we aim to use uh, methods uh, that are commonly used uh, to attribute Campylobacter infections uh, to sources uh, in high income countries uh, uh, based on uh, either uh, uh, traditional 7-gene MLST or core genome. MLST. So that is one major uh, step that we want to take. We, we are aware that the sensitivity of culture is limited and that uh, we will miss uh, species. So we will also use molecular uh, methods, uh, PCR, and we're now moving towards uh, quantitative uh, real-time PCR. 
will be uh, one method uh, that we will be using and we also plan to use uh, a metagenomic sequencing uh, method. We're still working on deciding which method uh, will give us uh, the best uh, results. So we try to implement uh, as broad a set of microbiological methods to characterize the Campylobacter community in, in those samples as possible and use all that information uh, to make inference about potential sources. All right, great. We'll have one more question. Um, and just a reminder that uh, this webinar has been focused on the formative research of this project and there is research ongoing. I believe it's uh, for the next two years or so and, and Ari and Sarah can clarify that at the end here. Uh, but this last question is from um, Ashanafi Bay. How about the effect of chat? Um, the chat chewing by mothers during breastfeeding on the Campylobacter prevalence. Yeah, so we did ask questions about um, chat chewing and it's, it's almost everyone, it's very high. So you don't get a lot of variability. Um, there's not a lot of research done on chat. Um, there are some constraints on researching it, um, but by and large, it has become an area of interest for us in this study. And we, we have a number of students and um, collaborations happening around the, around the edges of this collaborative effort between a lot of institutions, but particularly between UF and Harmai University to sort of better understand all of the implications of chat production and chat consumption or chewing in the area. We know that chat um, chewing is an is a, is a, um, appetite suppressant. So at minimum, it may be affecting um, dietary intake among women or choice selection, um, but it is very widespread. And we haven't, I have to say, Ashanafi, it's a great question. We've looked at chat chewing against a lot of other health outcomes, dietary diversity of the child, growth of the child. I don't actually think we've looked at chat chewing against Campylobacter, so that's something we can certainly look into. Um, but by and large, I think the message there is we have a lot more research to do on the effects of chat production, chewing, and the way that it's transforming the local landscape um, to better understand child growth in a region. All right, uh, we're getting very good comments in the chat box. Um, and we just talked about the chat chewing. Um, so that's a little theme that has come up. We want to make sure we're clear of what we're talking about. That's something I learned today. I don't know what chat is. I'm going to have to look on Wikipedia and learn about it. Um, but thank you to everyone who participated and our, our research, researchers and presenters today, especially. I'll let you have a final word. And if you even have a question or comment for each other, Dr. McCune and Dr. Havilar. No, I want to thank uh, all the participants in this meeting for their attendance. Uh, and uh, we'll have a closer look at all the comments in the chat box and, and get back to, uh, to people who ask questions uh, when necessary. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd only add that a number of these papers are out in publication. So some of it can be, some of the questions can be probed in more detail in those. Um, and last but not least, it does feel, we've, I feel rather half full without our Ethiopian colleagues here today. So just another circle back to say, um, recognizing that a huge, none of this would happen without our partners um, who are widespread in Ethiopia right now. Exactly. Thank you so much. I saw a message from Krista McNaughton from the Gates Foundation also that she needs to join another call. But we do appreciate her joining us here, staying with us, and giving that uh, introduction at the beginning. Again, this presentation and recording will be made available on our website. We thank you all for participating and joining us today. Uh, this is Jim. Or I'm going to be signing off from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.